excited about that. And, and just, just the fact that people were coming and being blessed and just having a wonderful time with that. So I do want to make you aware of a couple things. Um, because we were doing the launch, we kind of forgot a lot about these things here. How many remember getting the cards? We saved the seat for you. I've actually been giving these away at the dealership like all the time. And um, so grab some of these. Because even if we gave away 10 cards, just 10, just randomly give them out, just 10 cards, you know, a month. You know, we would still in two years have 4,800 exposures of just, just saying, hey, we reserved a, a, a seat for you. Doesn't mean that you're begging them, you know, to come to church or whatever, but it's just saying, hey, you know, we reserved, I've got a couple of people, a couple of salespeople, I told her, I put their names on the chairs, it's underneath. And she says, you put my name on that chair? I said, yeah, you better put your butt in it. And <laughs> so, I mean, you know, sometimes you can talk to people. I mean, you can't really say that in church, although I just did it. I forget it. But, uh, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's all it's all good. I, You know, I've got this message, man, that it's just been kind of burning uh, in me in the last two weeks. And it was great having Pastor Carl. Uh, preached last week and giving me a little bit of a break, but I was like, dang it, man, I want to get cranking on something. So I've got a few things that I want to share with you that I, that I think is going to be a big blessing. So I want you to go to Psalm 59, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the winning hand. And so we're going to be videoing today. People have been messaging me, how come we don't have it on video the last three weeks? And it's just because the, 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 what we were using didn't have the capability of of handling all the videos all the time. So now we're using my phone. And uh, so it, it's been amazing because people have seen this on YouTube. They've seen it on Facebook. They've seen it on Facebook Live and all that kind of stuff. I would not be offended. I told you before, I would not be offended if you held your camera up and it goes Facebook Live because how many know the word needs to get out all over the place and every social media venue, whatever the case may be. So I do want to say this. When I'm talking about David and uh, that some of the... Some of the greatest benefits come from some of the greatest battles. Some of the greatest benefits come from some of the greatest battles. And, and the Psalms is a journal of David's journey. It's a, it's a roadmap of his Psalms in the midst of his sorrow. And Psalm 59 is really interesting because David is, we've all known David to be the Psalmster. He's the harp player guy. We never really kind of associated it too much as a warrior, but we'll get into that part. But basically, he's the psalm guy. And in Psalm 59, David starts off and he says, Lord, you are my strength. And he's very compassionate in this. He says, God, you are my strength. I watch for you. God, you're my fortress, my God on who I rely. And then the New King James, for those of you who really love that, because some people say, you should read the King James. He says, God is my defense. And then in verse 10, he says, God will go before me, and he will let me gloat over those who slander me. And I was thinking, gloat? Man, what's up with that? Because now he, start, he starts off as being this compassionate David, and now David is just going, you know, using words like gloat and slander. And then in verse 11, he says, but don't kill him, Lord, our shield, or my people will forget, and your might uproot them and bring them down. And I'm thinking, well, here he is, he's, again, he's starting off so nice. And now he's talking about, you know, bringing them down. Don't bring them down for the sins of their mouth, for the words of the list. Let them be caught in their pride for the curses and the lies they utter. I'm like, wow, he's getting a little kind of ticked off here. And verse 13, he says, consume them in your wrath. Well, where's that little soft David now? Now David's getting a little kind of ticked off. Consume them in your wrath. Consume them till they are no more. I'm like, my gosh, he's getting a little hot here. Then it'll be known to the ends of the earth that God rules over Jacob and they return at evening, snarling like dogs and prowling about the city, and they wander for food and, and howl if not satisfied. And in verse 16, then he starts to get a little compassionate again because I'm looking at the scripture and go, Well, he's starting off really compassionate, then somewhere in here, somebody ticks him off, and he's getting all mad, and then all of a sudden, he cools his jets. And then in verse 16, he says, But I will sing of your strength in the morning, and I will sing of your love, for you are my fortress, my refuge. In times of trouble. And so here is the ups and down prayers of, of David. Sounds maybe a little bit like some of us sometimes. And we're like, oh God, you're great. And do my neighbor, do my neighbor, teach him a lesson. But, oh God, you're great, but teach my neighbor a lesson. And I'm just wondering why David was such an emotional basket case. I mean, why was he so fragile? Because he was tender one moment and terrible the next. Then I just got to think, I knew that David had a range of motion, but I was actually surprised at his range of emotion. 
One minute he's hot, one minute he's cold, one minute he's loving, one minute he's hating them. And many people knew that, they knew the public David, but very few people knew the private David. They, they didn't know the struggles that he was going through. We all know that Saul had issues, but sometimes we don't think that David had his issues. And you'll see later on what I'm talking about when I say that many people knew the public David, but not the private David when it comes to Saul. And here's the big question, that if, if no weapon formed against me shall prosper in Isaiah 50, 54, 17... And if I am more than a conqueror, why is it that we feel more than conquered? Why is it at times that sometimes we feel defeated and deflated, knowing all along that that's not part of our destiny? I don't know if you guys have ever gone through that, but I will tell you this. God is not your refuge from trouble. He is your refuge in trouble. He is your refuge in trouble. Trouble sometimes, it will come. And some of the times in your life that you think that you're in trouble, you're actually in training. Oh, I know you don't want to get, get you don't want to get jump on this one and say, preach Bobby, preach Bobby, preach Bobby. But I'm telling you today that God is about to turn your tragedy into triumph. I will guarantee by the end of this message, your, your tragedy will turn into triumph. And what you think is, 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 is a trial is not God's denial. In other words, the absence of God is, is not doesn't mean that he's silent. The silence of God is not the absence of God. You're not in the penalty box. I just want to let you know about that right now. You're not going, oh, you're a bit bad. You're in the penalty box. But sometimes when we think that we are in trouble, we think that we're having a trial, and we're thinking we're going through all this stuff, maybe, just maybe, it's a little bit of training to prepare us and get us ready for something bigger that God has in store for us. 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 46 is that whole story of, of, of David and Goliath. And if people didn't know that David was anointed and set apart to be king, boy, they knew that after he got done with Goliath. Because here's the kid that was just out of the field, minding his own business, tending the sheep. God turns around and he anoints him to be king in front of all of his peers. And how many realize that just because God anointed him to be king right then didn't mean that he was going to step into his kingship? How many have ever had a prophetic word given to you and, and you're like, well, when is it going to happen? So Cheryl and I had one back in 1902. And um, 1902. Not a long time. I'm glad you're listening. So we had, I don't know, when was it? It had to be 1980. When did we meet? 1982. We got married in 82. So that was in Calgary. So it was 1982. So it was like the fall of 82 or the fall of 83. Hey, my preaching. You can do that. And so it was in a long time ago. And so we were at this church and this guy named Donald Northrop came up. And, he, and he, he was starting giving words for people and all this kind of stuff. And how many ever, you know, when you get in those services, you're either the one that wants the word or you want to run from it. Because you know if the dude calls you out, he's going to read your mail of some sort. And you're thinking, oh. And so he comes up and he says, you two stand up right there. And we're like, huh. And so we stand up and he says, he says, he leans over to myself. And he says, you kept your hand to the plow. You haven't looked to the right. You haven't looked to the left. You kept your hand to the plow, and, and you're going to be speaking to tens of thousands of people, and your word is going to go forth like a hot arrow and pierce the heart of those who are listening. And at the time, I wasn't doing any speaking. I was taking out her dad's garbage. That's what I was doing. And I was driving the bus, cleaning the bus, doing all the dumb stuff that nobody else wanted to do because I was the, the yellow stripe. I was the rookie in, in the group. And, and I had to do a lot. And I was thinking, I don't know, dude, where you're getting all this tens of thousands of people because I haven't even taught a Sunday school lesson yet. And how many realize sometimes when you get a hold of that word, you're thinking, yes, I am going to do this. Yes, I'm going to do that. And see, Dad, I told you. But all of a sudden, we just kind of kept it on the back burner. And we, that stayed on the back burner for years. Uh, uh, huh? 10 or 15 years. How many realize when you get a word, and how, sometimes we act on the word way too prematurely. And sometimes you gotta you gotta grow into the word. And sometimes it just it just it just gets there and you, you, you have to percolate on that on that word sometimes. And so here's the situation where David, you know, he gets anointed as king, he's in front of all the nations, he's anointed as king, and what does he do? The, the very next thing he does, he goes back and he starts doing all of his sheep stuff. He starts taking care of all that stuff until he was called to deal with Goliath. And that's where we are right here in the in the story. Because David began to, it's interesting, David began to declare what God was going to do. If you know the story and you read the story, and David was just beginning to declare it. And we talked about that two weeks ago, all the things that he was saying. 
And he wasn't saying, he wasn't saying this is going to be a prophecy. He was saying this was going to be a promise. And sometimes we need to give God glory before the glory is due. We need to give God glory before the glory is due. We need to be determined to declare before the deadline. Oh, I, I just got excited when I came up with the D words. That we need to be determined to declare before the deadline. I do that even when I'm out at the dealership. When I walk around the dealership. I walk around the cars. I said, Lord Jesus, sell this car. Lord Jesus, sell this car. Let somebody sell this car. Tear off all these crazy cars and get rid of all these things and let people make some money for once. <laughs> I do that. I walk around here and I'm like, God, what are you going to do? And so I was thinking about all this as we begin to declare and, de and, we're, and we're determined to declare the deadline. And I got thinking about it. Don't wait for a bridge to be built before you begin to march. Don't wait until you have a, a confirmed guest before you make dinner. I said, I'm not even going to wait until next year to get the grounds ready for next year. I'm getting the grounds ready now, preparing now. I'm praising him in advance for people. I'm walking out into the new parking lot in preparation for new pavement. I'm getting quotes to stretch my faith for the future. And I'm prepping for the prophetic promise even now. And if I keep using any more P words, I'm going to be spitting on you all over the place. Which is why you're back here today. <laughs> So what did David say? What did David say to Goliath in this in the whole Philistine nation? It's in verse 45 and 40, 46. You can look it up. And as I began to read all this stuff, he just began to make, uh, he, he has this, he wasn't cocky, but he had this incredible amount of confidence to declare victory before the battle. And way too many people go around talking about their giants rather than to their giants. They sleep with the giants rather than slaying the giants. And David understood a spiritual truth about the power of words. Joseph Garlington said, nothing happens in the kingdom until something is said. Sometimes life begins to flow from the heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, the mouth speaks and David knew. David knew that the God of the impossible was on his side and it was about to make the impossible possible by making a declaration. He was making that declaration. And David, listen to this, David partnered with the unseen realm of heaven and he brought heaven's reality into the manifestation on earth. And I believe that when we, get, when we begin to do that, when you leave, walk around and just begin to say, Lord, we just pray for a new parking lot. God, we pray that for a new lawnmower, Jesus, name, please. You know, uh, and a riding one for the big fat Italian rear end that's going to sit on it. And God, that we can clear off the land. And Tom gets his little, little thing and he clears off more land and a wood chipper. And so we don't have to get all your kids to drag all the wood stuff all over the place. <laughs> but I'm thinking... <laughs> I'm thinking about all this thing, but how do I, it's, it's, it's one thing to be anointed. What does the anointing mean? The anointing means the perpetual, per, the perpetual propulsion of the power of God in your life. All these great big P words. She's going, <laughs> the perpetual, resident, ruling, reigning, residing, uh, power, the, the inherited ability to perform in the realms of the unknown. That's the anointing. But it's one thing to be anointed, but it's another thing to be anointed and appointed. And David was becoming that which, was, that which he was anointed for by showing up for the appointments. See, you could be anointed as king and then just sit there in your throne and do absolutely nothing. Because there's so many people, I don't even know if you know any, but I'm sure you've heard of people who have had words from, you know, pastors and prophetic guys and, or God himself. And they just sat there and they're just, they're just thinking, well, he must have meant that for somebody else. And yet there's times where we sit back and we go, huh, I think it's time that we start to become the very word that was spoken over me. And it's in, one guy said, you become what you behold. And, and it's, how many of us, it's not a, when we see, you know, God move and we see people get prayed for and they fall on the ground. And, you know, how many say, you know, somebody said one time, why is it that people fall on the ground when you pray for them? And the answer is simple, because they can't stand up. <laughs> but here's the deal. If you fall on the ground, how I many know it's not what happens when you fall, it's what happens when you get back up. If you get down there and all you've had is a ooey gooey and a fuzzy wuzzy and a then that's your whole experience and that's your whole experience. But if you haven't come back up, changed, and all that was just flesh. And sometimes I want to get people, they, they want to come up and get prayed for. Sometimes I'm like, don't let them catch, just let them fall. Oh, that's being recorded. I shouldn't say that. 
but we become what we behold. And we're all becoming something, whether we realize it or not. We're all becoming something. That we're all becoming something that we don't even, maybe sometimes even recognize. How many of you have ever seen people that they've been into a service and God has really touched them in a really interesting way. And then they come out of that service and then you see them the next week and then you're like, well, what has happened to you? Your language is different. Your countenance is different. Your, your smile is different. You're, you're, you're wearing deodorant. I mean, you know, something has changed and you're wearing mouthwash. My God, it's been a miracle. But it doesn't matter if you're idle, active, complaining, or conquering. It doesn't matter if you're under, if you're an underachiever, overachiever, a visionary, or just breathing. That you're becoming something, you're becoming something because every breath that you take provides an opportunity for action one way or the other. And as God begins to move and God begins to do something, then change is the ultimate thing. Change begins to happen. And here's the key. To the degree to which we understand our identity and our purpose... Who we are becoming is always determined by the degree of our revelation of who Jesus is in us, through us, and around us. Amen. If all Jesus, I was at the dealership one, and well, it seemed like that's where I live. But uh, one guy came on and he, and he had a necklace, a cross around his uh, neck. And I said, oh, you're branded now. You have a cross around your neck. You must live for Jesus. He said, oh, no. I said, oh, then it's just an empty piece of jewelry. I said, if you're going to wear this thing, you've got to live it or you just have to change it. Because now you're identified with Christ. And he's like, oh, I never thought about that before. I said, well, that's good. I showed up so you can start to think. <laughs> Bill Johnson said, beholding Jesus cannot be reduced to reading about him in Scripture. It can't be reduced to just reading about him in Scripture. My God, I'm quiet today. Just about reading about him in Scripture. There has to be a living, breathing experience. In other words, that the word has to come alive. Got to come alive. Scripture says every good and perfect gift comes from above, meaning that even the most successful of non-believers have God-given gifts that they have yet to be acknowledged by the individual. And the tests that David endured were tests that specifically addressed his ability to keep focused on his identity and his purpose. And he was tested in every single circumstance of life. And it was almost like God was saying something like, will you be king when the people you used to serve are verbally attacking you and hurling insults like spears to you? Will you be king when the people you serve turn against you? Will you be king when your palace is a cave in the wilderness? And will you be king when your closest friends disown you and threaten you? That was the challenge because the key today is to place your heart, your motives, your intentions, your will, your desires, your character, your integrity, and your name in the palm of God's hand. And to stay close to his heart. If you're wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus, know for a fact that you are the culmination of divine destiny. When you really understand it, when we understand who we are in Christ Jesus and what our identity really is, then things significantly change. And from that identity comes the confidence to face your adversary like David did. David knew his identity. David knew that he was touched by God. David knew that he was protected. David knew that he had a shield round about him. And when you have that confidence, that confidence replaces cockiness all day long. And you can step in the face of whatever your adversary is, thus saith the Lord. And David had three statements that, that the Goliath that triggered action from heaven. And here they are. David said... In the name of the Lord. That David boldly proclaimed without reservation or without hesitation his allegiance to God. He was not fighting for his reputation. He was fighting for righteousness. And David knew that he spoke as a representative and he was given much responsibility. And with that responsibility came much authority. You've got to understand, and, and this is something that Pastor Cheryl and I talk about you know, regularly. When people come up and they say, the Lord told me. Even though we may not necessarily agree with the situation, once somebody throws the Lord told me in there, then I can't go against the authority of Christ. I can't challenge somebody says the Lord told me. And so when, when people do that, sometimes they do that just to kind of maybe silence us sometimes or to get their point across. But we've, we've known that we have to honor the word and we honor what God is doing in people's lives. And I say, we, we can't argue with it. They say, God told me to do this and God told me to do that. And then that's fine. The second thing is David said, the Lord will deliver you to my hand. And his confidence 
gave him courage. And the third thing David said was that the earth may know that there is a God of Israel. To David, Goliath wasn't an assassin. He was an assignment. And sometimes we look at all of our troubles and we look at all of our adversaries as, as assassins when they are really nothing more than an assignment that God has put in front of us so we can take that assignment or accept that assignment and step into that appointment and then we can begin to do something significant for God. Oh, I don't need y'all getting this like I got it this week. But maybe you'll understand this, that the destinations, I'm sorry, the destinies of nations are shaped by our declarations. The destinies of nations are shaped by our declarations because life and death are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18.20 says, From the fruit of their mouth a person's stomach is filled. With the harvest of their lips they are satisfied. And Proverbs 6.2, That you have been trapped by what you said and ensnared by the words of your mouth. And so when I realized that and what David began to say, I came into agreement with this, that when we come into an agreement with our assignment, we will overcome all assaults from spiritual assassins. I know that sounds like a bunch of, but if you get it and you understand where it's coming from, that when we come into agreement with our assignment, we will overcome all the assaults from spiritual assassins. It doesn't matter what the devil puts in front of you. You are more than a Nike. You're like, what? Well, Nike means conqueror. So you're more than a conqueror. But I know sometimes that sometimes people feel like they're more than conquered than more than a conqueror. But the Bible says that you are more than a conqueror. If we want our words to have positive power, they've got to be filtered through the Father all the time. Number one, we, we receive the word. Whatever that is, we receive it. And then we become it. And then we release it. Sometimes we have to, be, we have to uh, become the very word that is being spoken to us. <clears throat> You're more than a conqueror. No, I'm a weakling. You're more than a conqueror. No, I'm a sap. You're more than a conqueror. No, I'm weak. You're more than a conqueror. That's right, I could be a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. That's right, I am a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. What are you, you going to tell me that I'm a conqueror? Sometimes you need a repetition to begin to tell you what God says about you. That I am, I am, I am. You're not some thumb-sucking, incubator, diaper Christian. God says that you're more than a conqueror. You're more than just a churchgoer. We don't need any more churchgoers. We need giant slayers. And I don't know where you are, but I hope that you're a giant slayer. And before we move on, I want to give you four positive things that can cultivate your ability to be a giant slayer. Number one is the name of Jesus. That when we recognize the power of the name, Colossians 3, 17, Paul said, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, for him. Number two is recite scripture. That the revelation of scripture is revealed truth. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Number three is declare your identity. Much of the church has an identity crisis that we don't really know who we are. We don't know what we stand for. We don't know. Some don't even know what they believe. And then prophecy destiny. Not only can we, like David, declare our identity and our association, but we also must declare prophetic words over our lives. That I am more than a copper. I am, you know, tons of scripture that begin to edify you and build you up. I know there's enough people tearing you down all week long, and then you come to Sunday, you come to church on an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Maybe two hours if the pastor's any good. And then you got two hours out of the whole week that we're supposed to puff you up, build you up. I'm going to scripture yourself, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. You know, get in your word, get in scripture. Don't go like just on Sunday morning and punch the God ticket and, and do your time clock. And then like, you know, you, you do your thing and God's like, oh yeah, cool, you showed up. But I want to talk a little bit about David's wars because David, David is a worshiper. David is, is a warrior. David is a winner. And then now, because of all the accolades and all the accomplishments, now he's got women chanting his name. You think, what? Well, yeah, in 1 Samuel 18, 6 and 7, remember it said all the women got together, they had a little parade, and Saul killed his thousands, and David killed his tens of thousands. And, you know, how many, at that point, you know, how many know that you can be in a lot of trouble if you start believing your own publicity? You know, I'm great. That's right. I'm the anointed one. My book don't stink. I'm awesome. 
And you start believing your own kind of identity. And, and in Psalm 59, listen to this, we seek David's strength in Psalm 59. Remember, you are my strength and all that. But in 1 Samuel 19, here's the historical context where we see David's struggle. And we need to see David's, we need to see his struggles to understand his strength. And it's important to understand his struggle or we will misunderstand his strength. Because you're thinking, well, why did God anoint him to be king? Did God anoint him to be king? Or did God anoint him to take off the giant's head? Did God anoint him to be king and have a voice? Or did God just anoint him to be king to be a warrior? And how many are like, it was all of it. And when God anoints you and sets you apart, he has an assignment, he has an appointment, he has something for you to do. And some of your greatest testimonies will come from your greatest test. So your greatest testimonies will come from your greatest test. In 1 Samuel 19, 8, it says, And there was war again. This is after David chopped off his head. And there was war again. And David went out and he fought with the Philistines. And he stuck them with a mighty blow. And they, and they fled from him. And I was thinking about this this week. That Saul counted on David. David was like, David was like Saul's right hand man. But how do you know that people will sometimes use you? Listen to this. People will sometimes use you for what you can do for them while secretly hating the threat that you represent to them. Why was Saul so stinking nuts? The hand of the Lord was taken off of Saul's life and put it on David. Can we say in all confidence that there was a little bit of jealousy? Some of David's biggest battles were not with what was standing in front of him, but with what was living within him. You think, well, I thought David was a man after all God's own heart. Well, yeah, but he had a bunch of decisions. The what decisions, the when decisions, the why decisions, the, the how decisions. And you see, while one battle was being won, another battle was being waged. And there was all kind of stuff going on in David's life in 1 Samuel 19 and 9 says, Now this distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with, listen to this, with a spear in his hand and David was playing music with his harp. And I got to start thinking, how can we serve someone who is, who's threatened by, by your potential? You know, Saul was having a hard time with this. He saw God's hand on David and he knew that the hand of God was lifted off of him. And he started to be upset by all this. And David was blessed, yet Saul was bewildered. And I looked up bewildered and then deeply or utterly confused, perplexed or puzzled. Saul became jealous and he knew that the hand of God was all over David and not him. And Saul, Saul is not even thinking anymore. He's out of control. He's a raging lunatic. And David is tripping out. It, it, it's just because it's just crazy. David's tripping out. Saul's tripping out. And then Saul comes along and he's lashing, he's thrashing him, he's accusing and he's threatening and he tried to kill David six times. All byproducts of this whole battle within. That's why I said sometimes it's not just David, ladies and gentlemen, but there's the, there's the person that people see in public and then there's the private person that you have to deal with all the time. <laughs> Saul is trying to kill the very one that God sent to help him. But Saul sees David as a trick and not a treat. David held a harp. And Saul is holding a spear. And Saul is now throwing spears at David, the very one that God sent to help him fight his battles. So here's the question. Are you trying to kill something that God is trying to use to fight your battles? Because sometimes we're fighting against what we should be fighting for. Verse 10. Thank you, Lord. True. You're either, it's all true or everybody's going, I'm thinking. <laughs> Saul in verse 10, he's just so crazy. He sought out to pin David to the wall with a spear. But he, David, slipped away from Saul's presence. And he drove the spear to the wall. And so David fled and he escaped that night. And you've got to see this, this picture. I don't know if we have it up here. Go to that area. Maybe the next one's a little bit better. That was a little fuzzy. Well, that's even worse. But anyway, it's all good. Saul has a spear. David has a harp. Who do you want to go into battle with? We have to stop trying to kill what God is trying to use. And who do you connect more with? David playing a harp, minding his own business, or Saul with a spear trying to prove a point?
point. Spirit or heart? Who are we going to go to battle with? And I don't know about you guys, but I really want to be a man after God's own heart. In both ways. I want to go after God's heart and I want the favor of God at the same time. I want to be the guy. And I, I, want, I don't know if you have this problem, but I want to kill my own Goliath sometimes. And if you were really honest without raising your hand, but you can raise your consciousness. I've got some Goliaths in my life that I want to kick your butt too. I want to take their head off. And your size of your Goliath may not be the size of my Goliath. My Goliath may be like this, your Goliath may be like that. But we all have some Goliaths in our lives that we want to just take out sometimes. But the problem is, like I said earlier, we just want to live with our giants and not address our giants. Ah, but let's face it. Sometimes I'm fighting against what I should be fighting for. And Saul had his hand on the spear. David had his hand on the heart. And, and I don't know. I just think David was at a situation when the spear was in the wall that he had to make a decision. And if Saul was smart, he would have killed David right then. I don't think Saul was thinking right because remember I said before that David had really good motion, but he struggled with his emotion. David took a pebble and he flat knocked that giant out. He had a good aim. And here's the struggle that David was going through when the spear was in the wall. Don't you think David could have plucked the spear out of the wall and took care of Saul right then and there? He could have done that. And that was the decision process that he was going through. He had to make this decision. Do I take my hand off the harp and reach for my sling and throw back the spear, knowing that I'm a pretty good aim? But what did he do? Nothing. I don't know about you, but I like some of the war movies. And I was thinking when I saw it, there was like, nothing. I'm like, what do you mean? Nothing. And I was thinking, you by the spiritual whip. Why don't you just get that spear? Get the story all over with. But he ducks. And I'm thinking about this, that David had this reputation. And it must have been hard for David to retaliate. And I don't know. I think sometimes David could have manipulated it. David could have dominated it. David could have got his own way. God, David could have dictated the situation. David could have done anything, but the spear was stuck in the wall, and David does absolutely nothing. He, he doesn't even take his hand off the harp. He doesn't even go for the spear. And Saul sh should have done it. He should have got it over with. But you got to remember that David was a man after God's own heart. He was anointed to be king. And there when I'm looking at the story, there, there had to be another hand in the room that the scripture doesn't talk about. Because it was, it was very close. If you do a little bit of a study, you'll find that they were in the room. It wasn't hard for Saul to pick up the spear and knock him out. But there had to be an interference. There had to be something in there. That other hand of God had to be there. And what does David do? David doesn't do anything, but he abducts. Saul had his hand on the spear. David had his hand on the harp. And then in the natural, and we would have think that, you know, the greater chance of winning obviously would have been with Saul because Saul is a seasoned, well-trained warrior who could not miss at a close distance. But Psalm 31, 15 says, My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Saul can't kill what God has crowned. He can't kill what God has crowned. And y'all ain't getting it. He's playing a harp. This mighty warrior, he's playing a harp. I would probably not go into battle with some dude playing a violin. I probably would have gone into battle with a guy who's an experienced warrior and had a spear. Because I know that my chances in the flesh, anyway, might have been better going that way. But see, David doesn't operate in the spirit of the flesh. David knew that he was appointed to be king. David knew that he had to make the right decisions. And I was thinking about this, that the harps 
of your praise. The harps of my praise reach havoc in the hallways of hell itself. David knew that the hand that plucked him from the field, delivered him from the beast, killed that giant, stopped the spear, was nothing more than the hand of God himself. And I was wondering, maybe, maybe, maybe worship is a weapon after all. Maybe we have to let God fight our battles more often instead of us trying to defend our reputation. Oh. Now, Laura's saying amen. We'll see how she says amen on this one. Because if you don't know how to worship, you don't know how to fight. If you don't know how to fight, you don't know what it's like to win. And if you don't know what it's like to win, you're not in the game. And if you're not in the game, you're, you're just watching. And if you're just watching, then somebody else is doing what you're supposed to be doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, that's true. And when I realize this, come on, I'm sure. When we realize this, that I don't, I don't fight for victory, I fight from victory. Amen. Because the world fights to get back and get even. But guys, our worship is our weapon. I hope as the weeks move forward that we understand that sitting on our hands is not worship. Shouting isn't worship either. Because worship is really nothing more than a condition of the heart and a reflection of what God is doing what he's done, and what he's about to do. That I am declaring through my worship, not only are you awesome, not only are you great, but you're going to be awesome and you're going to be great in this community as well. David knew that if he can win the battle with his soul, that God would win with Saul. Sometimes we all need to duck like David because the war is, with, the war is within and so are the weapons. That you can't fight fear with a spear. You, you can't. You can't fight fear with a spear. And what did he do? He kept playing the harp. So when David says in Psalm 59, God, you are my strength that watch for you. You, God, are my fortress, my God, on whom I rely. You know that he's not worried. I had a dear friend in South Africa, a drum and tom. Drum and tom told me one time, he said, if you were say it better. He said, if you worry, you'll die. If you don't worry, you'll die. So why worry? In other words, the way I understand it is this way. That worry is the dark room where negatives are developed. If you worry all the time, you're a negative nanny. Nobody wants to hang around because you're worried all the time. What about, what about, what And about has never even happened yet. And you're worried out and you're freaking out and you're wondering what's going on. But it's interesting that David wasn't watching the spears. He was watching God. And David had his eyes on God, not Saul. And David's name means beloved. And the same crown that was placed on beloved David was also put on you and I. And that same crown that fit David's head also fits mine. Because Psalm 59, again, he says, but don't kill him, David. He said, don't kill him. Lord, our shield, or let my people forget that I might uproot and bring them down. Oh, it's so awesome because I'm thinking about this today. I'm thinking, uh, you know, David, David actually had a weapon. And his weapon was interesting. David had a weapon and it was the shield. So there's the hand of God in the story. There's the shield. And then I wrote this down that I think it's up here. It's not there. Going back to another one before that. Yeah. When Saul's spear started sailing, David stood behind the shield of his savior. Just burp. Saved by man because I thought it was good when I put it together. When Saul's spear started sailing, David stood behind the shield of the savior. Psalm 28, 7, I'll give this and I'm done. The Lord is my strength and my impenetrable shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. And, and, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is my rock and my refuge and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of salvation, my stronghold. You, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Our souls wait for the Lord and he's our help and our shield. And in all circumstances, take upon the shield of faith, which, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts and the spears. 
of the enemy. So when you put your trust in God and the spears start coming, Glenn, come here for a second. You're the closest thing to a shield that I know. Quickly. Spears of accusations. Spears of assaults. And then all of a sudden, you turn around. Spears start coming. No matter what they are, I'm, I'm standing behind my shield, the shield of my Savior, and I'm, I'm ducking. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the devil wants to put in front of me because my Savior sent me a shield, and it's Him. Thank you, there, my shield. <laughs> no matter what comes your way. No matter what the shield, what, it, what the what the spears are, whatever the accusation, whatever the assaults are, whatever the dark, if they're fiery, whatever they come, and you can stand there all you want and say they don't come, but you know good well all we want they come. And sometimes every day, and sometimes every hour. And the closer you get to God, the more darks are going to start coming. Because people aren't going to understand you. They're not going to understand why you're so excited. They're not going to understand why you're sticking Jesus free. They're not going to understand why you pray as much as you pray. And these darks are going to come. Don't ever take a spear that the enemy has sent to you and start, start doing stuff in your own. You don't need to fight your battles. That's why you have a shield. That's why you have a savior. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for you. Don't get anything out of that? A little bit. It's 12 o'clock. We're out for the Baptist. Jesus. I love, I think it's dead. I love this message this week. And I love the fact that a lot of us can relate, can relate to David. We all have this crazy emotional roller coaster ride sometimes, and we're like, I don't, I don't know what to do, but the natural tendency is to retaliate. Because we think that we have to defend our reputation. Our reputation is nothing more than revealed righteousness. God, I just want to be more like me. I want to be, you know, I want us, 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 us. I look at visitors as part of family, even though, you know, you know anybody who comes, we're like, man. And you're going to, you're going to jet today. And I'll guarantee you within the next four hours, this is going to be real. <laughs> Somebody's going to run their jobs. Somebody's going to flap their gums. Somebody's going to say something that's going to tick you off. And then you're going to have to go, spear, spear, shield, duck. Just let, let, let the shield of faith take the spears. Don't try to do this on your own. That's why we partner with the cross. Amen. Let me share this with you and we'll be done. So I've been telling you a little bit. You don't know this part, but um, there's a lot of people that... Some who sent me the, the thing today, this week, about the banner, and God said, uh, use your name in vain, quit using mine. Because how many people say, they'll, they'll use the Lord's name in vain, right? And so my, some of you know the story that my sales manager, he's always saying stuff like that. So just the last two weeks, he's just been saying, oh, boot it down. Oh, confuse it down. Oh, Jake, damn it. Or, you know, he, so I'm trying to train him. Use other names, but don't use Jesus' name anymore. And it's so funny because he gets mad at a deal and he's going, and I walk in and he goes, oh, hold up. <laughs> this week I heard him going, I heard him say, 